right. So if you're out in the lobby, I know you can hear me. Come on in. Grab your seats. Uh, we got a few of us in here. Um, we are running a little bit behind in our schedules this morning, so thanks for being cool about this. So you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Um, I think this will be important for the few of us that are in here uh, as we start out. Um, there we go. I'll let some of you guys come in. All right. Um, I'm uh, I'm in charge of like putting together the flow of our services and how these times work. And so uh, this week, as I was preparing this, um, and we were you know we were walking through this. The question came to my mind: Do you want to be in the presence of God? Now that that question in itself can create like theological conversations, and people say like, "Well, the presence of God is always there." Well, I'm not trying to get into a theological conversation. What I'm trying to say is: Is do you want? to be in the presence of God. I think that's one of the reasons we come to church. So whether there's a whole room full of people or just a few of us that are here on time, good job, by the way, <laughs> right? Do we want to be in the presence of God? Do we want to be there? So some actually uh, shared this with me. It's a long God story behind this, but they shared this with me this morning. Uh, so in, the, in Acts chapter 4, uh, the disciples had been preaching in Jesus' name, and so the leaders of the day were getting intimidated by that. And so they said, they said, in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, and they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Like, we need that kind of boldness in our day. And we say, you know what? I've seen God. I've seen him at work. I know him. Like, he's spoken things to me. I've heard him speak things to other people. So I want to encourage you to not give in to the voice that would say, don't sing, or I don't like this, or any of those other things that would come, I would say, if you know God, declare it. Tell of what you've seen. Tell of what you've heard. We're going to do that uh, in song form at first, um, but I want to just call us to that as a church. Like, we get to say, this is our God. We want to be in your presence, Jesus. We want to know you. We don't want it to be where, like, you're standing on a park bench and just people keep walking by and never, ever talk to you. Like, we don't want a God relationship like that. So engage that this morning. Declare it. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. And then we'll start our time. Jesus. There were disciples that were called before a court and told to stop. Intimidation was put forward to make your story cease to go. And they said, no, we're not giving in to that. We're going to declare who you are because we know it's true. So Jesus, for our gathering this morning for this church, would that be what we do this morning? We say, we will not stay quiet. We will not give in to voices of intimidation. But we will stand and say, we know our God is real. This is what we have seen. This is what we have heard. So God, would you grant us a time this morning, whether it's our first time here or our 10,000th time here, would you grant us to be in your presence in this place today? We pray in your name. Amen. Lost all the same.
joy, my King. God. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you that you are so good, even when there's nothing, nothing good in us. God, I thank you that you just come into our lives in such a big way that you can come in, break generational sin, that you can break old habits, that you can hang up old hurt. that it's just those things God they, they're like chains on us they weigh us down but what's so miraculous and cool about you is you can literally break those chains to where we are light as a feather and they do not own us anymore we are no longer bound by our generational yes. sin by our hurts by our habits we are free in Jesus
So we, we begin our service. I, I brought a question to you. I said, do you want to be in God's presence? That's not a question like, is God's presence around us? Like it was a question of intentionality of our hearts. Do we want to be in his presence? So what I want to do is I want to pray for us. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask for a very specific thing. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. We've actually been praying about this theme of intimidation. So I want to ask us to confess as a church if there's any area of our lives where we feel like we're experiencing intimidation. So if you feel that, some level, some area of your life, just put your hand up. Mine's up there with you. So listen to these words from the prophet Nahum in regards to that intimidation. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. So Jesus, those of us that are experiencing intimidation, remove it. We ask you, God, that you would knock that down that we would no longer live under that cloud, under that shadow, under that weight, under that burden, because you are good and you are our stronghold. So take that intimidation and knock it over. We have no reason to fear that. So God, this morning, Living Faith Alliance Church wants to be in your presence. We do not want to live under a spirit of intimidation and fear. That's not the Holy Spirit. So God, continue to break those things off. Teach us more from your word. Remind us that you know us by name. So the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. So Jesus, continue to meet with us, continue to draw near, continue to remove intimidation from our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on. Let's praise the Lord. He is worthy. He is worthy. I think you guys are getting a sense of that. So uh, here's what I want to do. Um, we are celebrating our Father who is good, a stronghold in the days of trouble. He knows us by name, and in his wisdom, he gave us fathers. So you know the little joke, right? Uh, having children is hereditary. If your parents don't have any, you won't either. You'll feel it. You'll get it. It's a slow one. It's all right. Um, so what we want to do is we want to honor our dads. So if you're a dad, put your hand in the air. Come on, turn around, take a look at the dads. Let's give them some love. All right. All right. Good. So we want to do, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. We want to do a little uh, competition with dads because we know dads can be a little competitive. All right, so we're going we're gonna to see what we can pull off here. Uh, so where is Ron? Is he coming up? Come on up, man. This is Ron Mason, you guys. He loves... He loves ministry to men. He loves helping guys come closer to Jesus. So um, there's a couple of baby carriages in here. So we got to figure out who's the dad with the uh, newest born baby. All right. So come on, we got right here. It's probably these two guys right here. So closest birthday. How old? Four weeks? Dang. All right. Okay. Good job, man. Good job. <laughs> come on, Matt. All right. All right. So Jesus, when he was 12 years old, was blowing people away with the questions he's asking. So we thought we'd try to find the dad with the closest son to 12 years old. Any, any dads have a 12-year-old? Come on, right out here, nice. Can you catch? Oh, daughter, no, we gotta have a son. Sorry, trying to snag a t-shirt for free, man. No. This is church. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, way back here. Kurt, 12-year-old. Launch it, man. See if you can get him. 
<laughs> oh man. <laughs> this is a throw at your own risk, okay? <laughs> All right, and then uh, we wanted to see who had the dad, who had a dad who was not born in the United States, and we want to see who which dad was the furthest born away from here. So, if your dad was not born in the United States, let me see a hand. We got one, two, throw them up. Ron, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's gotta be Ron, man. You guys are from Pakistan, man. Like, is anybody further from Pakistan than here? Germany? Yeah, I think Pakistan's farther. Anybody further? All right, come on, let's hear it up for Ron. And just, just an FYI, Ron is the guy that designed those cool pin holders. He measured it, built it. So thank you, man. He's continuing to bless a lot of people. All right, so I'm gonna have our I'm gonna have our ushers come. They're gonna take our tithes and offerings while uh, we get a couple of announcements in. So, um, you guys go ahead, come on and grab your baskets, and we'll start collecting that. Uh, so, one of the things I wanted to mention to you uh, is that next weekend, next weekend is our Taste of Mission weekend. Uh, so, go ahead, guys, go ahead. So, next week we're gonna have one service at nine o'clock. I've told you before, this is not a Sunday off, so I expect this place to be filled at nine o'clock. All right, so we're going to have a good time together celebrating in the middle of our Taste of Mission weekend. So you'll have time at the end of the service uh, to sign up for a project if you have not done that yet. Uh, and then the next thing I want to tell you is summer ministry is starting. So it begins in July here in just a couple of weeks. So um, I know some of our staff is here. They're collecting donations and different things. So all of that information is at the Welcome Center. You can get sheets to hand out uh, to kids in your neighborhood, kids that live next door to you. Uh, so we're going to let you know about those things, all right? So we're going to go ahead and dismiss our treasure seekers right now. So first through six, you guys are free to go. Uh, we're going to let the kids head out. And then we're going to have just a short uh, family conversation. Uh, so as you know, um, Living Faith Alliance Church is in transition. Uh, Nate and Sharon have selected a, or been elected as district superintendent for the Eastern Pennsylvania District. Uh, so they get to run to the other side of the border. <laughs> so um, Sharon wrote something really, really beautiful to her kids, uh, and we've asked her to share that with us. So you're going to get to hear from Sharon. You got to hear from Nate a couple weeks ago. So take it away, guys. You guys are very precious. Um, I, when I reflect back on the gift it's been to be a pastor's wife in this church, there's a whole long list. I'm doing a lot of reflecting. But the biggest, one of the biggest treasures is uh, the feeling of getting to feel God's heart for how he feels about his family. So how precious all of you guys are to him, how much he prays for you and thinks about you, just, and, uh, and then just how much you guys have been honest and open with your story, and that's literally changed me, and I, I realize that's from being in your lives. And um, there's a lot more. Maybe I'll get another time. Um, but as I've been processing, I process in the morning uh, a lot. Sometimes I write down my thoughts. And once in a while, I go ahead and send it to my family for if they want to see a little snippet of what I'm thinking about. So this is a few of my thoughts that I wrote out. And they asked me just to read it to you. So this is uh, what I write. So we found out that nominations are closed. This is a little while back for Eastern Pennsylvania. So God is opening a door for us to serve the pastors and wives in Eastern Pennsylvania. Who would have known? God has been calling us to end our time as pastor at LFA and to follow him. We didn't know where we were going, but now today he has confirmed it is Pennsylvania. Like other seasons in our lives, we will have to let go of this LFA Vineland season in order to embrace what God has in this next season. We have lived in 11 places so far in our 38 years. We lived one year in Mound, Minnesota, four years in Lombard, Illinois, one year in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, two and a half years in Ambato, Ecuador, one year in Wheaton, Illinois. By the way, Caleb has lived in all of these places as well. Um, four years in Guayaquil, Ecuador, one year in Il Wheaton, Illinois again, um, two years in Queens, New York City, and 22 years in Vineland, New Jersey. I didn't even know where New Jersey was. <laughs> um, but now it's going to be Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 
This move will be the first time without our sons along. That's been significant. You may wonder why we would move at this stage of our life. Well, years ago, your dad and I both gave our leadership of our lives to Jesus, who is our king. And for us, that means that who we are, including our family, our gifts and passions, and what he has poured into us are all for him and for his kingdom. We are at his disposal, and our lives are for his glory. So as we've done our best to follow the Holy Spirit over these last years and months and have felt him telling us that we are to, we have felt him tell us that we are to invest in kingdom leaders. So we prayed about where he would want us to do that and we felt a big need for him to direct us to where in his kingdom he would want us. And after lots of prayer, processing, waiting, interviews and more waiting, we now know it is to walk with and invest in the pastors and wives in Eastern Pennsylvania district. We've been pastoring for 38 years, and now it's time to spur on other pastors in their calling. It isn't easy to leave the church family that we have grown to love and are familiar with. The most difficult is leaving behind a precious season where we have had the luxury of living with Joel and Sophia, Savannah, Alethea, Nakoa, Caleb and Sarah, Ava and Bethany just down the boulevard from us. That's our favorite street up and down the boulevard. <laughs> To, my, to Millville. You have been not just family to us, but you are very, very special friends. It is hard to imagine what it will be like without you so close. This morning, as I read Psalm 90, here are a few things that stood out to me. God is really our forever dwelling place. We live in him. Our lives are short. God wants me to number my days. He wants, me to sat he wants to satisfy me with his steadfast love so that I can rejoice and be glad in all of my days. I sense in a new way today to pray for God to establish the work of our hands, our three sons and their wives and families, and our LFA family of churches. May the favor and power of God rest on us and on our children and on our spiritual children as well. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I want to I want to pray, uh, but I want to pray now for Nate and Sharon. We'll have a chance to do that uh, in um, July and August. But what I want to do is pray for us, because what what you heard from Sharon is the story of uh, of walking by faith, and uh, walking by faith isn't the same as walking in your uh, leisure or walking in what's comfortable, um, but it's walking uh, under the authority of your father's voice. And so what I want to do is I want to pray that God would multiply lives that walk by faith among us. All right? So, so let's pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you for Sharon's example I want to thank you, uh, Jesus, that, um, that what she has blessed us all with was born out of hearing your voice. What she said was um, she spends time with you, and then sometimes she shares that with others. So there is this treasure trove that is unshared, and so of the little beauty we've gotten to see, God, would you multiply that among us? I pray that there would be men and women um, all over Living Faith Alliance Church that they learn a pattern of I gotta hear my father's voice. What's, what's my dad saying to me this morning? because that's going to direct my path. So Jesus, I thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for the example of her life. 
And so Jesus, just like uh, Elisha with Elijah asking for a double portion, we ask for a double portion of that faith among us. Multiply it, God, around here. Uh, one of the things that she said in her letter was uh, to her family was years ago, your dad and I gave our lives to King Jesus. And our lives are submitted to him and they are for his glory. God, that's just not a creed. That's just not an expression of something that sounds good. That is something that has impacted Sharon's calendar. It has changed her address. Her zip code is different because she gave her life to King Jesus. And so I pray, Jesus, multiply that among us, that our lives would be different because we have given them over to your lordship your authority. So God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of this example. And again, we humbly ask, multiply it among us, King Jesus, and be glorified in that. In your name I pray, amen. Knowing God, uh, current questions, timeless doctrines. That's our. Uh, that, this is our. This is our last week in in this particular study in this particular series. Uh, and in a couple weeks, we're actually going to start uh, preaching through the book of Judges uh, in the Old Testament. So, if you want to get a head start on on that, you can start uh, uh, getting your your nose in that part of Scripture and spending some time with God. Uh, and we'll be starting uh, preaching through Judges. We'll do that through the summer and into September. Um, but but uh, this is the last one of this series, and the question that we've been asking, the, the current question that we've covered uh, over the last three weeks, this will be our third, our third sermon on it, uh, is, is this question. To follow Jesus, do, do I really have to believe that God has designed a distinction between the role of men and the role of women? To follow Jesus, do I, do I really need to believe uh, that there is a distinction uh, in, those, in those roles? And, and what we've been saying uh, in the previous two sermons is uh, pretty clearly yes. Uh, yes to that question, that there, there is a distinction uh, in the role between men and women. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. And part of the path to true freedom for us as, as Jesus followers uh, is, to, is to obey what he has said, is to put into practice uh, his words. And so uh, for all of Jesus followers, for us to walk in true freedom, then the answer to that question is, is yes. We have to believe in a distinction between the role of, between the role of women, men and women. Um, now, that's a, that is not a popular thing to say within our culture. Like what I've just said, I could actually be fired probably from certain uh, roles uh, within, within our culture. Um, so it is a countercultural stance to believe Scripture, to believe what the Bible says, what he has communicated in his word, demonstrated in, in creation, that there is a distinction uh, in roles. But the issue isn't that I just simply want you to believe something that's countercultural, that we just target our minds so that we, we think differently. We don't want to stop there. What we want to do is ask the question, how does this change my life? How does this impact me? How does this relate to what it means for me to, 
to live out my, my masculinity? Or, or what would it mean for you to live out your, your femininity? So how do I walk by faith in my role as a man? Or how do I walk by faith in my role as a woman? So that's my job today. Pastor Nate, a couple of weeks ago, if you haven't heard that message uh, from two weeks ago, he unpacked the, uh, some of the doctrine of masculinity and femininity biblically uh, as, uh, through Ephesians chapter 5. Listen to that sermon, but that's not my focus today, isn't to, uh, isn't to teach the doctrine of it. My focus today is, is how are we going to apply it? What are we, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and to help us do that, uh, I'm going to have a panel um, uh, to help bring greater clarity uh, to this, this journey of faith um, towards biblical masculinity, biblical femininity. What does it mean to be a man or a woman according to God's design in Scripture? So I'm actually going to have them come up earlier than I did in the previous service because I want to make sure we get to hear from them. So uh, it's Sarah Howard, Eileen Hill, Ryan Carr, and Mike DiCicco. If you guys could come on up here now. Uh, give them, uh, yeah, cheer them on as they come up. So, uh, all right, you guys can, uh, you can grab a seat there. Um, so you just, uh, at this point, you just listen to me for a couple of minutes, and then you'll be sharing, all right? Sound good? Okay, so... Um, you know, at the end here, after we get to hear from, from this crew, you're going to have a chance to ask uh, some questions. Um, and so there is a means by which you can ask some questions. You can put that, uh, put that up on the screen there. Um, so you can text in uh, some questions that you would have uh, in the area of masculinity and femininity, and we'll try and uh, get to some of those questions uh, towards the end of our time together. Um, but before we hear from the panel, I want to remind us of some of the ground that we've covered. All right, so I'm going to take some time and review what Nate shared a couple of weeks ago uh, and then what I shared at the beginning of this particular, uh, of this particular one. Um, so, so we start with this. Uh, the, the, the key, uh, the key uh, to understanding God's design for men and God's design for women is to understand uh, that there is what we call mutual submission. Right, that God has designed men to submit and women to submit, uh, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, so when we, when we realize that we are submitting to one another, the, the call to submission is not uniquely feminine. Please hear that. The call to submission is not what the women do, Right? The call to submission is for all of us to do one to another. So that's the grid by which we uh, enter into this understanding of the distinction. And let me just remind you, so, so the impact of understanding that we are called to submit one to another rules out dominance. Right? It rules out winning. It rules out it's either my way or the highway, and it rules out abuse. There's no space for that if we are mutually submitting one to another. Okay? Everyone is called to submission. So what submission means is that we put ourselves under. Right? We, we get underneath of another, and we order ourselves under. We, 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 we set aside our agenda for the benefit of someone else. We get down low, use our strength to lift another up. These are pictures of what submission is all about, and we yield our preference for instant comfort to the need of another person. All right, this is all the stuff that, that, Nate covered, that Nate covered two weeks ago. Again, if you didn't hear that sermon, make sure you, uh, make sure you check it out. All right, so submission. Uh, submission is our opportunity to challenge an overcommitment to personal freedom. That's what we're doing. So when it comes to understanding your masculinity and femininity, the primary call is not get what you desire or not, not get what, what, what you feel you're entitled to. The, the primary call is submit yourself one to another. This isn't about your personal freedom. This is about building up another person. So countercultural, right? I mean, like what I just said, you never see any advertising campaigns like that. Submit yourselves to one another. Share a Coke. 
right? Like it, it, it's always about like self-actualization and, you know, so anyway, not that that's a necessarily a bad thing, but it has to fit within the context of we give ourselves for the benefit of others. The key text that we went through, you might want to write these down so you can look them up later. Key text for these sermons, Genesis chapters 1 to 3, Romans chapter 1, Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3. All right, those were the, the basis that we taught through uh, over the last couple of weeks. And out of that passage, we drew, uh, we drew some, some themes, right? So as we submit ourselves one to another, right, that submission gets expressed uniquely in masculinity, and that submission gets expressed uniquely in femininity. So, so we looked at what is that, that biblical submission for a man? What does that look like? Well, first of all, it is always under leadership, right? So, so, so a man submitting himself, right, to his design uh, as a leader, he is under leadership. Another thing that a man does is he takes responsibility, he takes responsibility. The goal of, 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 of a boy becoming a man is to move from boy-like freedom to the goal of taking responsibility. You don't live like Peter Pan forever. You actually start to think of others and take responsibility for others. So manhood is always about being responsible and taking responsibility. It is the opposite of, hey, that's not my issue. Hey, that's not my fault. Hey, that's not my job. It's learning to take responsibility to spread the blessing of your leadership to others. You step in. Now, that doesn't mean you step in and you control. That doesn't mean you, in your tool belt, has every tool needed to fix every situation. What it means is you, you step in, you don't withdraw, you don't hide. You don't, you don't enter into the world of your cell phone when things get a little too messy out there. And you just find a little comfort about me here. Right? That, that's not leadership. That's not taking responsibility. That's hiding. Right, that's, a, that's a, an expensive fig leaf to have in your pocket, all right? You don't withdraw into your phone. You don't withdraw into your work. You don't withdraw into ESPN, especially when the World Cup is on. I know that's tempting. Maybe not for all of you, but that would be one for me. Um, you don't withdraw into the great outdoors, even though it's springtime. You engage you submit yourself to your design and you step into the painful, complex reality of taking responsibility. And I don't, like, if you think to step into a situation requires competence, that is not the definition of masculinity. That is not what it means to take responsibility is you have to have it all figured out. Like, so often I step into it like, God, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I really need you to show up. That's leadership. That's accepting responsibility. All right, uh, next. It is sacrificial example of Jesus. He gave his life for the benefit of another. That's the call. I mean, that is, again, so opposite of our picture of masculinity, right? It's about me, build me up. It's about pumping up my chest as opposed to I give my life I give my life for the benefit of another person. That's the masculine example of King Jesus. He laid down his life for the benefit of his bride, the church. Lastly, the, the biblical picture of submitting to God's design is that it feels like, so those that are blessed by, 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 by men that are taking responsibility, it feels like nurturing and cherishing. It is a distortion of masculinity when it feels domineering or passive. Those are kind of the two expressions, right? We, 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 harm, we harm God's design for masculinity. We harm the picture of masculinity if we over-engage or under-engage, when it is too aggressive or too passive, too controlling or too, hey, I'm out of here. And in both situations, those that are designed to be blessed by our initiative are left vulnerable and hurt by over-engagement and under-engagement, where I just check out. 
All right. Uh, this is a great quote by Nate. Couldn't review his teaching without, without sharing this. The Bible plainly teaches that in marriage and in church, this is not just about marriage, it's marriage and in church. So this is masculinity, femininity in the church of God, right? So the Bible plainly teaches that in marriage and in the church, God's design is that without diminishing the value of women, God intends that there be uh, life if men will be willing to do what does not come natural, to step it up, to not be passive, Take initiative in a nourishing, caring way and lead. All right, so that is, that is God's design. That's just a, a snapshot of God's design for masculinity. And now let's look at God's design for femininity. Again, if, if, if the feminine would submit themselves to the design that God has, it would be expressed in a hope in one who is greater. It would be expressed in, in, in not a hope in our own ability or a woman's own ability to, 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 to figure things out, to get their mind around something and to be in charge, but a hope that there is one who is in charge and that one is good. Second thing, uh, that would be a picture of God's design. If, if women were to submit themselves to, to God's design for them, it would look like a preferring and deferring. So the, moving away from I have to be in charge to make my life work, but then there'd be a growing need to look for and to be under authority of preferring and deferring to authority. This would reveal that, that God's design is strength in community, that God has a design for partnership. Not this picture, this, this, this very Western picture of a, a hard, ugly commitment to autonomy and to control. Thirdly, the, the biblical role of woman, women would look like using their strength to nurture the strength of another that using their passion, creativity, insight, strength to bless and to serve others, to build others, to build others up. Women, can I just say that we need you? Like as a community, we, we need your voice. We need your creativity. We need your insight. We need your wisdom. We need your strength. And I know that historically, like for thousands of years, there's been this, this, this message of, of oppression. And even within the church, there has been some silencing of, of, of women. And so we're, we're fighting uphill against that kind of stream of history for me to say, we, we need your voice here. And, and I just want to encourage you, like, bring, bring your strength. For the, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's what, Jesus, that's what Jesus calls us to. So women, the invitation is to walk by faith in how God has designed you as women. Then uh, a couple weeks ago, we looked at three obstacles to this. So really quick, the, 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 the picture of God's design has been ravaged by sin. So every, just like I said, historically, this, this picture is so distorted for us. And there's been so much pain because of the, the context in which we're in, that, that, that this beautiful design of God, that God is expressing himself uniquely in the masculine and uniquely in the feminine, has so been broken and bent and distorted from generation to generation. And the, and the second obstacle is that our problem is not primarily about our sexuality. Our, our, our primary issue is our worship. The, the primary issue isn't about uh, do we understand God's design for men and women. The, the, the primary issue is will I defer to God over my own desires? Will I be God or will he? That's the primary issue when it comes to uh, figuring out, understanding, and walking by faith in God's design for men and women. And then thirdly, we are overcommitted to personal freedom. Like we have taken this beautiful thing that Jesus promises through the gospel called freedom and we have made it the highest ideal so that we believe the best life has zero boundaries in it. 
And so if you try and put on me the boundaries of what scripture says is male and what scripture says is female, I can't have freedom there because freedom can only be found in boundaryless living, which by the way, simply leads to bondage. Sexual freedom is not to be found in blindly casting off restraints of our design. That will lead to broken sexuality, broken relationships, shame, hiding, embarrassment, and pain. That is no freedom at all. All right, so this wasn't intended to be comprehensive. I wanted to remind you of where we've been over the last few weeks related to this teaching. Okay, so, so, so now what do we do? Do we just say, wow, that's, that's kind of complicated, not sure how to apply that. Uh, let's just move on to this Judges series that you're talking about. <laughs> the answer obviously is no. What I want to call us to and what I want to spend the remaining time that we have together on is that we would learn to walk by faith, that your story is unique. And I really want to drive this point home. I am, because every time we move towards application of God's truth, right, the, the, the tendency is that we're trying to make everyone look uniform. So in order for you to be uh, biblically aligned with the feminine, then you have to look exactly like this. Or to be biblically aligned with the masculine, then you have to look exactly like this. And your favorite movie has to be Braveheart. And you need to have a giant sword over your mantle at home, right? Like God's design is so unique. So the call is for you to walk by faith, for you to hear the principle, the voice of God, what he speaks in his word and say, what does that look like in my life? That's what, that's what Sharon and Nate were, were giving it, the example of what does that look expressed in their, in their life? We have to wrestle with our own journey of faith. Okay, so before I unleash the panel on you, I wanna remind you of Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Really quick, just, just remember the call here, Hebrews chapter 11, because the repeated refrain is to walk by faith. 18 times in one chapter, it repeats that refrain. So by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Sarah, by faith, Isaac, by faith, Jacob, by faith, Joseph, by faith, Moses, by faith, Rahab. By faith, these people had to express God's design for their life at their time, in their culture, at their day. Now it's our turn. Now it's our turn to live out our faith journey. And I think if we don't get this masculinity and femininity thing in order, then we're not gonna be able to line ourselves up with what is God's design for us to walk by faith in our day, in our time. So some of these were men, some of these were women. Some were old, some were young. Some of it was individual, other times it was corporate. But the decision was always to walk by faith. And what walking by faith means is this. Faith is the assurance of what is hoped for, right? That's what the English Standard Version, which typically I love the way they translate it. I don't like the way they translate Hebrews 11.1. I like the way the New King James translates it better. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? Both are legitimate translations, but the substance. So what, what, what the, the, the New King James is emphasizing here is faith is, is making visible the invisible. It's giving flesh, right, to what is spiritual. So it's the substance of what is hoped for. So to the world around us, we have the opportunity to walk by faith in this area so we can demonstrate God's design for the masculine. Hey, check out Living Faith Alliance Church. God's design for the feminine. Check out Living Faith Alliance Church. To walk by faith, we get to be the substance of what is hoped for. So I wanna call you, I wanna call you to, to work this out in your household in your context, wrestle with God's design for you. So faith is making visible what is invisible. All right, so now the panel. 
they're going to tell a little bit of their faith journey, a little bit of their story of the way that they are making these biblical principles right alive in their life. They're making they're bringing the substance of them right into into their world, how they have walked by faith. So uh, we're going to start here with my friend Mike DeChico. Um, so Mike, can you tell us uh, just what what does this look like in in Mike's life to to walk by faith in God's design for you as a man? Yeah. So I uh, start off probably eight years ago. I was uh, sitting in a service that Nate was preaching, and it was very similar to the message that he brought two weeks ago about the call of you know, uh, masculinity in, in, a, in the life of a man. And I just remember what I heard was a list of things that I had to do, uh, more things other than work. And I, at the time, work was my, that's what I thought my calling was, the provider. Um, you know, I worked a lot of hours. And when I heard that from Nate, I was angry. I was frustrated. Um, I heard stuff like, you know, if uh, it's time to grow up, it's you shouldn't, you know, as far as fishing, you know, he taxed fishing and hunting, things that I hold so dear to my heart. And, you know, uh, I just, I was very angry. And I came home from church and told Kelly, oh, I can't believe it. He's just, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This is crazy. Uh, so fast forward, a, a lot transpired between then and now. But uh, two weeks ago, when I got to listen to the same message, I, um, you know, I listened to it out of a heart of gratefulness because I know that I didn't hear a list of things that Mike needs to do, but um, I heard a lot of what that I get to do things and that I've been getting to do things and leading my family and and trying to lead my wife and and people that God brings into my life. Um, it's been a it's been a, a very great journey and, and difficult at times and. Um, I think the thing, as far as, I don't know, I was thinking, like, when God brought me from to a place where I embraced the call, um, I remember a lot of fear in my heart, and I remember a lot of insecurities. Um, I was fearful about screwing up. Um, I fear a lot about failing. Um, I felt very insecure in leading my wife, because my wife spiritually I, you know I look at her and it's God like she's on a, a she's like on such a different plane with you than I am and how how am I going to bring spiritual leadership into this situation what do I have to offer her that she doesn't already know her so that kept me from leading and um, and so I guess what what I've come to learn in in God fathering me now in in these areas of my life um, is that God doesn't need anything that Mike DeChico has. He doesn't need my wisdom. He doesn't need my strengths. He needs a willing heart. Like, that's what he needs. And so I try to give him my yes, and there's times I'm not good at giving him my yes still, and we fight about it. Um, but um, another, just a verse that I wanted to end on is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I believe, and it's where the Apostle Paul is... Um, he was talking about his thorn in the flesh, and he was talking to God, and he said, I prayed three times and asked God to remove this, and he didn't. But what God did say was, you know what, Paul, um, my grace is sufficient for you, and in your weakness, um, that's where you're going to see my strength. And so I'm learning in this journey of being a man to embrace my weaknesses, knowing that God just, he, he wants my heart, and, and he'll, he'll guide me, like Greg was saying, just stepping out. A lot of times into the unknown and saying, God, I don't know what I'm going to do in this situation. I feel so inadequate, but I know you have something. So that's, that's good. Thanks, man. So, yeah. So you, you, heard, you heard Mike talk about, right? You heard Mike talk about like a, a season of being overcommitted to personal freedom. So when he started to hear uh, God's, God's biblical design for men, um, it, it was a it was a rejection, right? There was a there was a battle there. He was angry over God's design um, because of an overcommitment to personal freedom. Uh, but but you heard also uh, he put a couple of things together as he was increasingly fathered by God. Then he was accepting God's call, right to to be responsible, right to to bring leadership. And so his willingness to accept his design, submit to his design, wasn't based on his competence, wasn't based on him being the smartest one in the room. It was based on, I'm gonna submit to the Father's voice. Beautiful, 
Good job, Mike. All right, Sarah. All right. Um, so I can really buy into the, um, the two truths for um, a woman's design by God that she needs to hope in someone who's greater than her and that she... Um, that the outflow of that then is to use her strength to nurture someone else or to nurture someone else's strength. Those things um, just really resonate with me. And I also just find that like over time, I am just so surprised at how those two themes are so pervasive for me, that it's just that they show up every day or that they show up just moment by moment or situation by situation that they're really deep and that they're really not natural for me, that it's like that God has to keep working them deeper into me and asking me to, to obey again and again. So I'm just surprised by that. Um, my personal story, the gateway into the Lord bringing healing for me and my design as a woman was in the area of beauty and what I looked like and the way that I am on the inside. Um, so it was like about my physical appearance, but also just like all of who I am. Um, I, I had like this just really, really deep, like inward belief about myself that I wasn't good enough and that I didn't measure up. And to the point where I really believed that who I was as a person and my physical appearance too, that I was ugly. And, um, but I, I had that inward belief, but then I used all of my strength and all of my resources and all of my energy to promote this like outward um, depiction of myself that I was good enough. So that just in the way that I dressed or the way that I presented myself or the way that I talked or the way that I interacted with people, um, I just was always trying to prove that I was good enough, that I was pretty enough or funny enough or just anything so that I could be liked and accepted and loved. So I did most of my life like that until the Lord just started speaking a different word to me in like the core of who I was. And the word was just about that I was beautiful and that I was good enough and that he had put me together in all the realms of me, like in my physical appearance, but also just in who I am as a person. Mm. And um, that word, um, it just, it was, it was hard for me to, I heard it with my mind and I kind of accepted it with my mind, but it was hard for me to let that be the outflow then of my life because mm -hmm. I had all these different actions or ways of interacting with my world that were opposite of that. So I found that to be able to believe that different word or to have that word transform my life, I had to act out in faith before I really believed it in my heart. So like I kind of believed it in my mind, but I didn't believe it in my heart. So what my story was and how that looked for me was that um, for me, uh, it had to start with my physical appearance because that was just a huge thing for me. So I, um, makeup was a huge thing for me. So I went for a season of time, I went without wearing any makeup and I would um, look in the mirror without my makeup and I would feel just, uh, what I would see with my eyes was I would see ugly or gross or disgusting. And I would look in the mirror and I would just have to say things about the way that the Lord had put me together. Like that he, mm -hmm. he is a good maker and that he, mm -hmm. that the reason why I was beautiful was because he is beautiful and he has a, a specific design for women across the board. And because I was a female, because I was a woman, I could just bank on the fact that I was beautiful, whether my eyes saw it or not. So I just kept on like going with that. And then that kind of trickled into who I was as a person and just went deeper and deeper. Um, and yeah, and it's the kind of thing that um, then it kind of flowed, and the Lord kept asking me to let that flow into the way that I interacted with, with other people and with other women. And he just like slowly over time would ask me to, to stop competing with other women, to stop hiding and just offer myself and just more be at rest and create a safe space for other people and be who I was, but not like be afraid of other people, other women especially, or be competitive with other women, but just 
be who I was, bring who I was. Um, and it's the kind of thing that I just feel like is still, it's like a daily thing that the Lord asks me to obey him in. I'm sure he will keep asking me to obey him in. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Do you guys, uh, yep. <clears throat> So you hear in her story, right, when, her, when, when she was hoping in, uh, when she was believing some lies, then she would hope in herself, right, and then her strategies to kind of make, make life work for herself. Uh, then Jesus invited her uh, to, to a new way of living to put her hope in him. And then as she did that, this is incredible to me, as she did that, what, what changed wasn't just her own worship, right, her own freedom, but what also changed was her ability to love others. So her interaction wasn't one of competition. It wasn't one of comparison. It wasn't one of manipulation. I don't think she used that word, but that would be an accurate description of what would have to happen, right? It was one of freedom, right, so as to nurture the faith of other people. So thank you, Sarah. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, Mom. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Um, my, actually, my husband's not here right now, but I think he was afraid that I was going to talk about, in his words, what it is to submit to a moron. But, <laughs> <laughs> but instead, I chose to talk about um, my design in the context of the church. That's a little broader. <laughs> so um, my story starts about 25 years ago on a snowy morning, and my husband had a, a, a business. And he got a phone call, which every parent knows that when you're trying to get out the door that something's going to come up. And so this was a, a crisis. A truck was down, and then with time-sensitive material, he had to leave and go take care of that. Well, he taught a Sunday school class, an adult Sunday school class, and we always studied together. Um, and so I wasn't unprepared, and he handed me his teacher's guide and said, you're going to have to teach the class. There's nothing else I can do. So not thinking too much about it, I went to church, he went to work, and I taught his Sunday school class. And even though I was not unprepared to teach, I was very unprepared for the fallout of me teaching an adult Sunday school class. And um, people actually left the class, and it was a pretty hard time for me. Kenny and I felt terrible. We never intended to be offensive or anything, and it just, it just happened. And so um, it was a collision of my gender, um, I, what I felt were my gifts, because I feel my spiritual gift is, a, is teaching. Uh, my personality, which always is afraid of and insecure. So uh, I was in a pretty dark, broken place for quite a while. Um, and the voice in my head kept saying, you just can't teach. You, you can't ever teach again. Look what happens when you try. And so <clears throat> this has been a 25-year process as I've kind of, instead of listening to my own voice, um, by faith, I'm listening to the voice of my father and uh, the authoritative voice of my father. Mm -hmm. And he led me to his word where he speaks to me clearly. And he told me to, um, <clears throat> if I needed, if I lacked wisdom, the verse I always prayed over Greg every morning, if I lacked wisdom, then I would ask him. And then he would give me the answers. And so he reminded me of a verse, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> In Romans 12, that Paul said, I urge you, brothers, um, by the mercies of God, uh, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through his word. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's what I wanted. Um, I also had made Jesus my king. And I wanted to do whatever he wanted. And if that meant listening to him and pursuing teaching and trying again, then I needed to do that. So it's been a process of, by faith, trusting him and uh, deciding to take my strengths, my design, my gifts, and uh, try to nurture others. So in the process of figuring that out, we came to LFA and ran smack uh, into Sharon who said, I really like your design and your <laughs> gifting. And so before too long, we were not only teaching, but we were leading uh, in marriage ministry and mentoring in pastorate. 
And we're just so grateful for the freedom that God has given me to live out the design that he has placed on me. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mama. Again, you see the pattern of hoping in the Father's voice, right, leading to freedom to nurture the faith of others. So thanks for being obedient. All right, Rykar. All right. So um, a little background about me is, um, as far as masculinity goes, um, I never really fit the ideal stereotype uh, picture of what our culture says masculinity or manliness is. Um, and I knew that from a very young age. Um, I was very emotional. Um, I felt things really deeply, um, and I wore my heart on my sleeve. Um, my emotions, both the sadness, sadness or anger, um, weren't really tolerated, and I was taught to hide my feelings. Um, I had a really confusing time growing up. <clears throat> um, I remember it feeling just like a like a war, um, and it w was mostly pointed out ways that I didn't uphold the standard of manliness or masculinity. Um, not only was I told by the people around me, um, like my peers, but um, I also experienced emotional um, abuse and neglect by some of the key family members, uh, male family members um, around me. Uh, so this left me really vulnerable uh, to believe those lies I was told, and I came, a I came to a lot of conclusions about myself. I began to hate myself more and more, and I just felt like Satan was just dragging me into the darkness. Um, I believe that the core, at the core of who I was, I wasn't a man. Um, I couldn't even be a boy. Um, I wasn't enough, and that there was something inherently wrong with me. And I probably could go on and on about how that played out for me, but, um, so I started to withdraw from people and to hide my personality. I remember there would be days where I would just say, don't be yourself just hide, like don't, um, don't let anybody see you, um, but then at 19, uh, it was a turning point for me, um, I started coming here, and there were some, God kind of like started peeling away those layers, um, little by little, I'm peeling, peeling away that darkness. A big part of that was uh, the men in the church, um, the leaders, Greg and, and Nate, uh, that really invested um, into me. And their leadership did feel like uh, nurturing and cherishing. Um, uh, God wasn't letting me hide anymore. And I remember being so scared to open up to them about anything um, that was going on with myself. But I knew that I, I didn't have to trust what they thought about me. Um, I had to take a step in trusting what God thought about me. Mm -hmm. um, so then I started learn. <clears throat> I started learning about what my heavenly Father really felt, um, who I am in Christ, and how He delights in me. He gracious, graciously fought for me um, and freed me from lies and wrong conclusions and deep pain that I wrestled with, um, along with a bunch, uh, like a bunch of addictions. <laughs> Um, I am created in the image of God. What he says matters. His word defines me. Um, he's my father and I'm his son. Um, and that is like overarching over my life. So now uh, my life is about investing in others. I'm comfortable in my own skin. Um, God uses some of the very things I hated about myself and was ridiculed for to further his kingdom. Um, he's given me a wonderful life. <laughs> And two beautiful kids. Um, that continues the breaking of generational sin. Um, and I also get to mentor um, guys around me. Uh, I get to serve you guys as a ministering elder. Um, and I'm also a teacher.